welcome to our latest episode of Lessons in Leadership. This is the uh, last episode in season two, uh, and I'm delighted to say today we're joined by Simon Jeffries, the founder of The Natural Edge. The Natural Edge is a leadership development consultancy specializing in mindset. Simon's got a really interesting story and background as how he was in the military, uh, moved into special forces, then into the corporate world, and is now an entrepreneur helping leaders develop and, and increase their mindset to, to allow them to be better leaders. Um, Simon, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Paul. Pleasure. Simon, I guess my first question, and it's the same that I ask everyone, is could you spend a couple of minutes for us talking through your career history and how you've ended up doing what you do today and some of the sort of lessons you've learned along the way? So began life as a Royal Marine Commando, uh, previous to that classic uh, school route, uh, then university, joined the Royal Marines, then went subsequently on to initially serve as a signaller, still a Royal Marine attached to the SBS and then did full selection and finished the remainder of my career serving with the SBS, uh, did three tours of Afghanistan in total during that time. Then got to the point where I decided I'd done everything that I wanted to do, was looking for a bit more control over my life, so not being away all the time. And I think a new challenge, having felt like I'd ticked those boxes, coincided with my partner at the time getting a job in London. So figured I didn't really have a plan exactly what I wanted to do. So why not try out the corporate world? Maybe that'd be a good fit. Got a job in a management consultancy in the construction industry realized quite quickly that that just wasn't a good fit i think i realized that it, it, it just looking forwards it wasn't where my life lay so i spent some time really figuring that out how i wanted my life to look and settled on essentially being my own boss running my own business and specifically online because i saw freedom around that so it tied in with the core value of having that freedom uh, made all the classic mistakes. You know, I started that on that path with a good friend of mine that we'd been in the military together. You know, started off with a yeah, we'll we'll build something two years easy. We'll be uh, millionaires on a beach in two years' time. Read all the books around business and entrepreneurship. Saw all the mistakes that everyone talked about. Said we'd never make those. Proceeded to make every mistake that we'd read about, um, and actually ended up. So I spent two years in London and. The, the first sort of big, I guess, business venture we tried uh, failed spectacularly. We spent all of our savings. My five-year relationship ended and we essentially ended up back at ground zero. And we actually moved back in, both of us, with my parents. Um, it's a little farm in Worcestershire. So two, two guys, mid-30s. It's a bit like the film Step Brothers. Uh, shared a car. A Ford Focus 2001 that cost us 400 quid um, and we were paying basically ourselves about that amount started from scratch from my parents dining room table um, but that's when we began the natural edge we, we essentially realized the, the big mistake there was we'd, we'd chase money we thought let's start something to make us money and then when we were back at that right at the beginning I guess right down the bottom we just said, let's do something we actually care about, we're passionate about. And for us, that had always been mental and physical performance, particularly the mindset side of things. Even when we were in the military, um, in special forces, it was always looking for that edge, I guess, really looking to see how we can improve, push ourselves, uh, get that those extra 1%. And so we took that as a basis and then looked at how we can translate that into helping people outside of the military um, do the same and that was end of 2017 we set up the natural edge and that in itself up until this point has been a, a, a very interesting and meandering journey where we've made several mistakes it's been a, you know a bit of a roller coaster but I, and I now feel only just at this point so sort of five uh, five years later that it's really sort of come together and we now really understand who we're serving and what we're providing and predominantly that the main focus is on mindset because the way that we see it mindset is really the linchpin of everything else in life every thought and emotion we have every action that we take all of our behaviors are driven by our mindset and so if you can make changes there 
the repercussions across the entire of life are massive. So that's essentially the services that the, the service that we provide now is helping people make those changes with mindset. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and you you had an interesting journey there where you talk about the military, you talk about corporate life, you call, talk about entrepreneurship, the the things you've done wrong along the way as an entrepreneur. You know, this is your your second business, and actually it it's going really well. And 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 you said there that now you feel it's all sort of slotting into place because you're focusing on who you serve and mindset. What was it that really brought you to that place to understand who you serve and? and understand how you can serve them best? It was really a process of trial and error. And and I think process is the key word there. Something that a theme that runs through everything we teach and probably the first concept that we really try to get across to people is what we call moving average. And essentially moving average is, embodies a few different concepts. So the first one, is the idea of, I guess, a growth mindset. So when you're in a fixed mindset, it's that idea that your abilities are set in stone. You see challenges in life or difficulties as a pass or fail test, as opposed to a challenge and something that you can prove and work on. The fact that you don't need perfection to make progress. So a lot of people fall into this trap in many areas of life of always looking for the perfect outcomes which just don't exist everything's a process of iterative gains and if you have a mindset where you're always looking at the event and always looking for the perfect end result it's going to be very stressful and also you're going to miss all of a the lessons and benefits of the journey but just the satisfaction and happiness because it all lies in the process and so for us on the business side of things it has just been the process of we started off with one idea and then through starting to coach people, understanding actually what people need as opposed to what we think they need. And then working with different types of people and understanding a who we enjoy working with and b where the best fit is. That has led us essentially to where we are. So we, we've had different programs along the way. We've had different coaching courses. We've served different types of people. And it's through that learning and that experience that we've ended up where we are. It's just taking all of, I guess, our background in the military, the coaching experience that we've had and the research we're continuing doing along the way to come to this point where it feels like it's slotting together. Okay. And you talk there a lot about creating a moving average. Um, I think it'd be really useful for the audience if you could just explain that a little bit more, because this was one of the key concepts you and I talked about when when we first met. And actually, I found it very, very useful in my day to day life to to apply that, especially from a business perspective. So perhaps if you could talk a little bit more about that moving average and and what some of our listeners, viewers might be able to do on on that uh, basis. So. The opposite of a moving average is something that I see all the time and I call it boom bust cycles. And that is when people get a big dose of motivation or they suddenly decide they're going to make a change. Health is a very classic example, but you can apply it to any other areas. So you suddenly decide I'm going to get fit. And so you plan out this perfect plan, eight weeks, this is what I'm going to do. These are the workouts I'll do. This is what I'm going to eat. And so you set off on this journey to make this big change and it lasts a few days, a week, maybe a couple of weeks, and then something will happen. A life will throw a curveball. Maybe your son or daughter gets ill, uh, business meetings overrun. You can't make the workout that you should have done. You can't make the meal that you should have made. You eat a snack or some foods that you said you wouldn't. And you start slipping into an all or nothing mindset where you feel that because you've broken the pattern of what you perceive as perfection, you, it's much easier the next time. It's, it's a gradual, it's a slippery slope, essentially. The next time something comes up, you start thinking, well, I've already missed that one. What's the point in doing the next one? And suddenly you just gradually start slipping. And before you know it, you're back to zero. And then you'll stay there for a length of time and then you'll suddenly hit a painful enough point again. You'd be like, no, I need to make a change. And you'll just repeat the cycle. And it's this up and down, up and down. 
as opposed to understanding that having a plan and systems in place is a vital element of the process but that you need flexibility and adaptability with it and it's consistency even if that action is imperfect get, gets results not looking for perfect action all the time so if you can't do a 60 minute workout well fine go and do 30 minutes go and do 20 minutes that still adds to your moving average you missed one of your meals fine one mistake is an outlier two mistakes is the beginning of a pattern if you just keep breaking the pattern and always coming back to moving average always just taking small actions to move you forward you'll get to where you want to be you know i've been working out and exercising for a long time i even this last week i planned out a certain amount of sessions and i hit i think 70 percent of them in the way that i wanted to because life came up i was i was out with, i was back at my parents funny enough looking after the place where they were on holiday different routine different environment etc so i just had to adapt to it so i didn't hit everything that i wanted to do um, on one of the in fact i'll give you an example this morning i planned to do a long run through a combination of just feeling it in my body that it wasn't the right move and mental headspace i just changed it to a walk fine that is still my moving average i'm still ticking loads of boxes i'm getting outside i'm moving i'm getting natural light it's good mental headspace free from screens and devices and it's still moving me forwards I, I don't need to hit perfection to still get the results that i want to get and i think that's really useful for people to know i mean i think we all fall into that habit occasionally of trying to be uh perfectionists and getting everything perfect and doing everything right and actually sometimes that stops you taking action and, and doing what you need to do to keep moving forward even if you're only moving a little bit it's better to be moving than than standing still it's exactly that it's the biggest difference i see between people who get the results that they want hit the goals um you know where they want to get to is this idea that it's those small wins. You just need those small wins. You don't need massive monumental shifts. And actually, usually when you chase those, it becomes counterproductive. As long as you've just got that constant moving average, you're going to get there. And often it comes down to we, we stick these arbitrary time frames, such as I'm going to do this eight or 12 week program. And yes, again, that's useful because we do need some parameters and guidelines to keep us on track. However, when things start to change, being flexible again with it, because maybe you don't make get to where you want to be in 12 weeks, but maybe you get there in 14 weeks or whatever it is. And also the understanding that really the end result is not the finish line, especially when it comes to health, but usually with work as well, there's always going to be something else. You know, you can't do a 12 week program and then that's it. The, the aim, and this comes back to process more than result, is you're not trying to get to say um, a certain weight or fits or whatever it is. You're trying to become the type of person that exercises or has a healthy lifestyle who, who is healthy essentially it kind of ties into this idea of external goals versus internal ones um, and aligning your goals with your values so for example if you want to lose weight you can do that but you can achieve it in a very unhealthy way you can essentially starve yourself be very restrictive it be a miserable process and you can hit your ideal weight or in your head what that ideal weight is and yet be more unhealthy as a result of it and feel worse as opposed to yes i want to get to this weight but also i ground that in my value of i want to be a healthy person and that gives you a guide rail that any of the actions you take must be in line with that value so that you're becoming the type of person that's healthy as well as hitting that guideline which will be a much more enjoyable process it will tap into your identity which means it, you'll be much more likely to stick to it as opposed to trying to rely completely on external motivational willpower. And it'll be much more enjoyable because you'll be taking actions that, again, sit alongside your identity. You're basically not creating a miserable process, which, again, you're, you're very unlikely to stick to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I learned a few years ago I've got to stop beating myself up when things don't necessarily go right and, and just get on with what I can do and, and affect what I can affect rather than uh, try and change what I can't change. Yeah, 
which comes back to it, which is something I see all the time is people trying to we worry about and concentrate on factors outside of our control, especially around other people's reactions, what they say and do or think of us. And also what you mentioned there about beating yourself up, it, it, it again comes down to that. It's slipping into the mindset of seeing something or pass or fail and also hinging your self-worth on that single moment of performance as opposed to seeing it as, okay, I didn't do as well as I would have liked. That's fine. What can I take away from this? How can I prove? It's more about your response to what happens than necessarily what has happened, what the situation or what the event is. If you always approach it with that growth mindset, of taking away, taking that self-responsibility of, okay, how much did I actually prepare for this? What could I have done differently? What could I have done better in this situation or changed? Okay, I'm going to take that and learn and move forward. And then the next time that happens, then I'll be better at it. It's, you know, military is a classic example. You don't join basic training, do two weeks and then get sent to a war zone. You go through basic training, which is in itself an iterative, pro iterative process gradual process of exposure to more uncomfortable or harder situations progressively so that by the time you finish you're in that position to then go to your unit and from there you know before you even go to afghan you do a six-month pdt pre-deployment training cycle and so you're getting yourself ready as much as possible inoculating yourself i guess to that stress stress and pressure so when you're in those situations where it is real life combat you're able to cope with it and everything we do in life is no different you don't go from zero to speaking on a stage in front of a thousand people and nailing it you begin by doing something to a couple of people at work or you you know as far back as you do your presentations at school university then in your work life you practice it you iterate you learn everything in life is a process there's, there's nothing that is not the result of a process mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, and and you said there it's about exposure to more progressive situations. And, and you mentioned the military training specifically. What would you say were the leadership lessons you learned during your time in the in the military and in special forces? And and, and how have you applied that into civilian life? So this one, there's a point that just jumped into my head, and this may or may not it probably does tie into the leadership piece but i'll use this to begin with and it comes back to that that process a key point to realize probably with everything in life sometimes people chase the goal of eliminating fear and discomfort they believe that that should be the goal by essentially doing work on yourself or however you view it that you'll get to a point where you don't have fear and you don't experience discomfort and that's simply not true and it's counterproductive. You never get rid of fear and discomfort. So take that example of going through the military. Yes, you get better. So the levels of fear or discomfort change. So when you start to experience them, but what happens is you still feel them, you get better at dealing with it. You get better at dealing with discomfort and actually embracing it and sitting with it rather than shying away from it or suffering under its weight. If you take um, athletes, for example, athletes don't suffer any less than you or I. Yes, the point at which that discomfort begins, say on a run or whatever it is, is far higher because they're far fitter than us, but they still experience the same amounts of pain and discomfort. What's happened is they are just much better at sitting with it, of dealing with it, of embracing it. And that anyone can do that. And that's the same through physical sense of things, emotional challenges work challenges by training yourself and actually thinking of it in that way when you go through challenges as opposed to trying to get rid of it which you'll never achieve it's understanding as you go through these experiences learn to tap into yourself how am i reacting to this what is my self-talk how am i approaching it and we can tap, talk about that later but there's simple ways that you can do that in daily life put yourself under some stress and discomfort and see how you react with it. How do you sit with discomfort? How do you sit um, with fear? So uh, it's probably a side point. I mean, it probably does tie into leadership just because it's a good lesson. Um, in terms of leadership lessons or, or the qualities I've seen in good leaders, it's a cliche, but it is, 
you know, those who lead by example, it's probably cliches are cliches for a very good reason because they've got valid lessons within them. But actually leading in the manner that you wish all people to act in is so important because, I mean, I don't even know if it's worth explaining. It's such an obvious lesson, but I think we sometimes underestimate that. So I think leading by example, I think communication is massive. Just how you communicate to your team and the level that you speak on. In special forces, there's, and it comes back, it's quite a good lesson on feedback. Whenever we, I mean, A, before a mission happens, anybody can voice up opinions on say pitfalls they see something that may have been missed other ideas there's there's no it doesn't matter what rank you are every idea is valid and will be discussed because even the most junior guy may see something that somebody else has missed so it is generally uh, the tl the team leader um, who will plan up the job but anyone can jump in with opinions or different ideas and they'll be discussed aired and discussed and then the same at the other end, once a job's been done, you have a hot breed debrief immediately. So as soon as you come back off the job, no matter how long you've been out, you know, you basically just ditch your weapons um, and body armor and you straight into the ops room for, for a debrief. And again, it's an open floor. There's no rank. Anybody can bring up anything that's happened. Um, and it's always constructive as opposed to so it's what's happened it's, it's not attacking the individual there's a kind of rule that you don't argue tactics um, that had happened at the time so what i mean by that is when you're on the ground when things are happening people will make decisions with the information they had at that time that they believed was right and you can't argue against that they did that because they believed that it was right at that time now, whether it was right or wrong, you can look back on and go, actually, it probably wouldn't be a better option to do this. But you don't attack the individual for doing that because they took that action because they believed that that was the right one to take. And so you just deconstruct things with divorced of emotion, I guess. It's looking at the reality of what happened or the facts as opposed to the emotions and people's feelings around it. So just having that, that good communication and allowing people to have that voice is I think always a good sign within teams when you have that, being able to listen to other people's opinions. And they may not be taken on board, but just having that openness to actually um, look at them is, is really valuable. And how have you found that transitioned stylistically from the military to the, the, the corporate world? Because Typically, what I've found in the in the corporate world is people don't necessarily like feedback um, because they take it personally, even though it's not necessarily meant as personal. And yeah. because of that, leaders don't necessarily like giving feedback either because it feels like the team member thinks they're attacking them when when they're not. And therefore, people avoid actually talking about really important issues and about how they could do things better for the betterment of the organization and the business. Yes. I think the difference is something that you get used to in the military is it's a very, and I don't know if it's changed now, but certainly when I was in, you know, for the moment you go into training, you're told in black and white, you know, nothing shied away from. Um, it's, you get very used to almost having blunt, I guess it's a very blunt organisation in that everyone's very upfront. Um, and so you get used to that. And so people just learn to let go of, because you are, I guess you are broken down in basic training, you know, you're just fully exposed, your full character, there's, there's no escaping you with people 24 hours a day, like people just get hammered, you know, the mick taken out of them on different things. And so you very quickly let go of that defensiveness um, around things, you just kind of become at ease with that. And it allows you to have an environment where things can be brought up without people feeling like they're being attacked. But I think alongside that, a lot of it comes down to delivery. So it is individuals like us as individuals need to learn to see things as feedback and not criticism. And again, that comes down to a lot, whether someone's got a growth or fixed mindset. If you're really stuck in a fixed mindset, no matter how someone delivers it, you're always going to feel it's an attack on you because you're placing your self-worth, your ego on the result whether it, you know it's pass or fail as opposed to this is something 
that I can improve upon. Um, you know, a very good example to illustrate this, and it, it actually ties into how we speak to kids. So a famous experiment that was conducted, two groups of children, puzzles given to each. One group was praised for being very intelligent once they've completed the puzzle. Oh, you, you must be so clever. You've done very well at this. So it was all results based. The other group was praised for effort. You tried very hard. Well done. <clears throat> they were then given subs subsequently more difficult puzzles to solve. What happened, the group that were praised for results and intelligence gave up far quicker because A, they believed once things got hard, well, what's the point in going on? I've hit my natural intelligence ce ceiling, so therefore expanding any more efforts pointless. And B, they placed or linked praise with their self-worth, which means if I then go on to fail, that will get taken away. So I'm better off to stop than to keep on trying. Whereas the kids that have been praised for effort understand that keeping trying by keeping going, that's where the benefits come from and they're more likely to solve. And also that they're getting praised for the effort. So that's, that's where the benefit comes from in the process, not the end result. Interestingly, when they, they, they got the both kids to write to another school and explain what they've done and explain the challenge and the kids that were praised for intelligence and results were far more likely to lie about how well they did, because again, they've linked results with their self-worth. And so you'll see people in life in a, in a fixed mindset. And it's generally not that people have growth or fixed across everything. It can be different areas. So for example, I had, I'd say a very growth mindset around the military or my job work, the things that I'm doing, I understood it's a process. I was actually quite fixed when it came to relationships. I was very much in the mindset of, oh, this is me, I can't change. So that's it. As opposed to, well, actually, if you're willing to have difficult conversations, to be open with your partner and be willing to work through things, it's no different from anything else. A relationship isn't some, you know, great relationships isn't something that some people have and others don't. It's the result of work, of effort, of dedication, of working through things. Um, and so in the work environment, as leaders, I think in the first instance, it's worth going through some kind of training around growth and fixed mindsets and getting people to have a look at themselves. It all comes down to the self-awareness to see, oh yeah, I do look at things like that. Maybe I can start switching my mindset. And then it's how do we present feedback, the tone that we give? Are we giving feedback on the work or are we, you know, adding some bias in towards that individual? It's, it's how we deliver it. And I guess the culture and atmosphere that you're creating with your team as a leader. But it is, it is one of the biggest points. Receiving feedback from people is most people have that sort of monkey, the chimp in their heads pop up and have that are you being I'm being criticized and it's that ability to stop that to be able to step back and go hang on a minute no I'm being criticized or given feedback on my work and my work is not me that is not my self-worth it is something I've done and it's just a process again you know if you actually think about it it's a bit bonkers to think that you can produce something and it's always going to be perfect like you're going to produce something and there can never be any improvements you're essentially saying I'm perfect my work's perfect which is there's no, I, one, no one on the planet I, I'm a Yorkshireman so actually that does apply to me Simon <laughs> that is a fair point I'll take that <laughs> um Fabius you mentioned there a lot about self-evaluation and where you put your self-worth um and, and self-awareness as well so how do you go about evaluating yourself as a leader and how do you understand and sort of acknowledge when, when things aren't going right and, and, and how do you correct that? I'd say it's a, it's a combination of internal and external. So internal is that ability to check in with yourself and the key word or, or, or key with this and any kind of work around ourselves is honesty it's that ability to be really honest with yourself, to be able to look at where you've done well and also where you're not doing well, where you can improve. It's, it's that honest self-evaluation. Really, until you're willing to do that, it'll be very hard to move forwards because you'll just keep kidding yourself and stay blind to the parts where you're falling down. So it's that self-check-in and the look at yourself, that self-responsibility of where you can improve. 
And then asking for feedback as well, looking to your team. Again, it comes back to these honest conversations, almost like occasionally having those meetings or weekly meeting where it's, okay, guys, let's have some feedback on how the weeks went and including yourself in that. How have I been serving you? How have I, how have I, how can I help you better? What can I do differently? You know, do you feel in some ways that, you know, I'm not serving you or whatever it is and, and being open and willing to take that. And you have to, with all of this, there's a degree with any feedback and it's tricky. The thing of all is it's not easy because in anything, us as humans are always the most complex factor because we are complex beings and we all come to the table with our own set of beliefs, biases, emotions, etc. And so when you take feedback, for example, looking at ourselves or taking it from other people, you have to weigh up A, yourself and ask yourself, Am I importing my own bias into this onto whoever's giving me the feedback and the piece of work and how much, you know, can I divorce that and actually look at the facts? Then you've also got to consider, is the person giving me feedback? Have they got any bias? Because, you know, some circumstances you have to realise that sometimes it's valid what you're getting. Where can I pick out the valid pieces from this and where can I discard the rest? And also realising that <clears throat> maybe that odd occasion, that person... <clears throat> he's just being a bit of a dick and you need to be able to take that and take, well, they're just projecting that onto me. And, and so it can be quite hard figuring through this sort of maze, I guess, of understanding ourselves and other people and the environments we're working in, but we get better at it by practicing it. And it does come down to that awareness piece, just being able to step back, try and divorce the emotions, look at the facts, look at the situation. And it is just a skill. And that's probably the biggest thing I'd say with all of this, with any kind of mindset work. Mindset is skill set, but often we don't treat it that way. We understand for physical change to take place, we need you know, a structured and systematic approach. We can't just listen to a podcast or read a book and expect to change. And yet with mindset practices, we pretty much do the opposite. We do just listen to the old podcast or read a book, um, watch a TED talk, whatever it is. And then we expect decades worth of neural pathways and behavior patterns to change. It's not going to happen. You need to be practicing all of these things continually, building your self-awareness. Um, you know, come back to the, the factor of control. We use a simple uh, system called CIA, control influence, except when a situation happens, just be able to step back, stop and go, okay, what's within my control here? What can I influence? And what do I just have to accept? What is out of my sphere of control or influence? And there is no point worrying about. Um, and the more you do these things, the more natural it will become for you to do them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree. I mean, when I started on my leadership journey 20 years ago, you know, if, if, if anybody criticized me or if anybody uh, uh, suggested a different way of doing it, the, the, the procedure then would be to tell them how wrong they are and, uh, uh, and why, why we were doing it my way and that why my way was best. But obviously, that's, that's the start of your journey. And then as you go through that, you realise that actually some of that feedback's really important. Some of it is a case of people, you know, just projecting and you've got to be able to differentiate that from the stuff which is actually really useful and really positive and, and take that forward and, and act and behave accordingly in, in, in order to influence and, and to, to achieve the outcomes that are best for the organisation. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree. Um, what leadership quality do you think is overrated? It's interesting. You are, I did have a think about this. And I suppose one that pops up and it, if we're talking about specifically leadership roles, I think sometimes intelligence perhaps can be overrated. And the reason it you know, popped into my mind is the classic documentary, Enron, the smartest guys in the room. You know, seventh biggest corporation in, a, in, a, in America turned out to be the biggest Ponzi scheme um, going. You know, it's run by the most egotistical, narcissistic uh, guys in the country um, and caused a lot of damage to a lot of people. And just be, so essentially... And I don't think it just applies to intelligence because I think it's a more broader point that just because you're very good at your job, so let's take someone in the military, very good soldier, or I don't know, banking, they're very good at the job that they do, but then those people are put into a leadership role, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a good leader. You can be very good at what you do, that doesn't always translate to leadership. 
and so I think that's a key understanding and often people are put in those positions and the military is a very good example of it people get promoted basically through time served as opposed to leadership qualities often and just having that one you know in a squadron that one position the sergeant major role or officer you know commanding officer role change it can suddenly change the entire atmosphere of that squadron it, almost overnight just because of the way that they run things and it, it, the repercussions are massive because they set the tone obviously it is that top down setting of tone so i think just the quality of being good at what you do doesn't always translate to being a good leader and sometimes it can be detrimental almost what you were saying there was because they've been good at what they do it's that kind of it's my way or the highway and they can't see outside of the parameters of of how they do things because that's worked for them in the past but that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work when you're leading a team um absolutely and that's that's really the pure definition of of the peter principle in that people get promoted to a level of incompetence. Um, yes. And a lot of the time we see this in the corporate world where people get promoted because they're very, very good at what they do, but they're not necessarily given the training or the skills and the development that they need to be good at the next job. Um, so being good at one thing doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good at another. Exactly. And it's, it's also a good example, something I've definitely learned in retrospect if we look at things in terms of mindset, we always put on a pedestal almost people, say special forces or perhaps elite athletes or even business, you know, CEOs, great business owners. And actually, just because you are very good in that narrow definition of that role, perhaps you do have, we, you obviously do need a strong mindset to achieve that level of success in, in whatever that arena is. But just because you've done that, that doesn't necessarily mean translates across the board. And you see it all the time with in the military, guys that are great in operations, everything else in their life is falling apart. You know, same with business owners, amazing in the sphere of business, relationships are falling apart. You know, not spending time with their kids, health is going down the pan. It's, I think it's just that understanding that, of course, there's lessons to be learned through those fears, but doesn't mean you've got everything figured out because you're successful in in one arena and it's it's definitely something i see with our coaching when we do work particularly with ceos or business owners you know however it is it's the most common thing we hear is on paper my life looks great i've i've got a great job you know i've got the house the car uh, you know good family and i i should be feeling great i should be feeling happy and, and enjoying this and yet i'm not i'm missing whatever it is that feeling of purpose i procrastinate more than i should um, my health's not where it should be my perhaps the relationships aren't what they should be but from the outside it looks great and i think that's yeah just something to understand and also a point on that is you just don't know what's going on just because something looks great from the outside. You've got no idea what's going on with that person or inside their head. And social media's, you know, really taken this to, I think the next level it's, we just see snapshots of people's lives and we never see the full picture. Um, and it's just something to understand that, you, yeah, you really don't know unless you're in someone's head, you've got no idea. <laughs> No, Simon, thank you very much for that. It's been a great interview and, and thanks for having you on the show. But before you leave, could you um, just let our listeners, viewers know how they can contact you if they if they want to reach out to you? What's the, the best way for them to do that? Uh, so the easiest ways on social media, it's The Natural Edge, uh, LinkedIn. It's just under my name, Simon Jeffries. And our website is thenaturaledge.com. And for anybody who's interested in that, I will put links in at the end of the video. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for, for coming on the show today. Pleasure. Great to chat to you. Thank you for having me on. Mm -hmm.